Okay, good. So uh, today we are going to continue okay, the discussion of the user factor hook and uh, in particular how to use uh, uh, these um, side effects uh, to integrate the client with the server, okay, like, like we started uh, uh, last week. Hmm? Uh, We're going to see some aspects which are uh, a bit more complicated. Uh, um, especially when we deal with the modifying data and uh, all, 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 the, <laughs> all the sorts of problems that come out with this um, asynchronous behavior. Okay, so we already learned uh, um, that uh, use state and use effect can so interact easily. Uh, when we already saw that, that we can use a state change to trigger an effect. That's easy. Or we can change the state inside an effect, depending on what we need to do. So it's normal, um, there's no problems or no conflicts uh, because in both cases, uh, we are, what we are doing is just to schedule an effect to be run or schedule a state change to be applied, okay? So uh, always the state uh, will, um, all the, the render phase will be completed and then we schedule a state change and then the component will be re-rendered. In React, we always have this, this sequence of, of actions that help us you know, in, uh, in, in avoiding any kind of uh, rest conditions in, in, a, in some way. Um, there are some issues that we need to be aware of uh, in the, the dependency array. Okay, uh, remember that in a user factor, the third parameter is an array of dependencies. So all the variables that, uh, if changed, they, they will uh, re-trigger the, the, the callback, you know, the execution of the callback. And uh, the, the rule here is to remember to include all the values uh, in, used inside the, the callback okay, in the dependency array. So let's to make this example. Uh, this callback here, okay, is using the uh, say information about the open state inside its implementation uh, because it's calling the set open, uh, you know, um, callback. And so every time we are, you know, in a callback using some variable that is coming from the component itself, basically. So they could be props, uh, that could be states, uh, that could be local variables. Likely there will not be local variables because uh, we try to have the hooks as the first instruction. So let's not make any computations. So let's stay on props and, and, um, and states. Uh, we, inside the hook, are we, are we are using some of these, we must list them in the dependency array. Why is this uh, a requirement? Because uh, um, it would be a strange, okay, uh, if we run, maybe imagine um, an effect that is going to change something according to different dependencies. I don't know, uh, uh, um, something where I have uh, maybe three conditions, I need to flag three boxes, okay? Imagine when you are shopping for something at the end of the box to check, so, okay, I, I agree with the, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, the contract and I want to sign to the newsletter or whatever, okay? So there are different states that correspond to these variables and only when all the three are checked, okay, you need maybe to uh, to issue a call, an API call, saying, okay, the user accepted or something like that. So you want to, this function, to um, check uh, the state of the three buttons um, every time one of them changes. Okay, if you forget one of them, then you will have uh, uh, some state change that is not, uh, you know, uh, analyzed by the, or not felt or not seen by the callback. Okay, so it may seem boring, but uh, actually every variable that you use inside the callback for a user effect uh, should be listed in the dependency array. 
okay? just to avoid that the variable changes and the uh, effect is not triggered. And maybe the effect will be triggered when another variable changes, and so we'll discover that the first variable has a different value than what it expected because mm, it didn't uh, you know, uh, get involved in the first change. Okay? And so it may uh, you know, generate, uh, I would say, stale content in the page. Some content is, is old, it's not being updated just because it forgot to run a side effect. Hmm? So this uh, is a, it's a quite a strong uh, yeah, condition and sometimes also the um, React itself will show a, a warning if you, if you forget some of these dependencies. Um, by the way, to be exactly formal, sorry, where do we have the slide? It was in the slide, sorry. Uh, in this effect, uh, we are also calling set open as a function. It, technically, set open is an object uh, that we create, create outside the function, outside the callback, and we are using inside. So technically, also set open, the function, should be included in the dependencies. Technically. Okay, because it's an external variable, an external object, uh, whose reference uh, we are using inside the callback. Um, we tend not to do that for, so every function, okay, every callback uh, uh, that we define here should be uh, included as a, as a dependency. We often don't do that because we know that this function is not going to change. It's not going to be redefined to something else, okay? Uh, and if it's being redefined, it's because the component is destroyed and recreated, and we are going to recreate it, another function with the same behavior. So actually, if the object also technically changes, we know that uh, we'll, it will still do the same thing as before. Okay? So uh, unless we do strange tricks uh, with uh, callbacks uh, that we are passing down to the props, uh, Okay, so a callback in a um, father component then is passed down. Uh, if we are sure that the uh, father component doesn't change the implementation of the callback, we could, in a way, uh, uh, relax the rule and not list all the callbacks uh, inside that come down with properties uh, in the dependency array. Okay, so let's say we need to list all the values and especially values that are not functions, no? values that are strings, arrays, other types of objects, uh, we, could, we could close an eye on, on functions. Technically, this would also be required, but in practice, we know and we are, you know, we are responsible that they are not going to change, so they will, in any case, they will not trigger the effect. Um, Every value reference inside the effect function should also appear in the dependency array. This is the rule we are trying to, to apply. Uh, all the arguments of the function, so we are calling a function, its arguments, in this case, the argument is a constant, so there's not a problem, but if this was an expression, in the dependency array, we should put the variables that are used inside the expression. Okay. Not the expression itself. The, the array is not an array of values. It's an array of variables. Okay, so we cannot here put something uh, like an expression A plus B. If in the callback we have something like A plus B, then we must list A and B as dependencies. So anything that could change the execution of the callback should be listed down there. Okay, to avoid stale values and old values. Um, also, beware that uh, if the execution of a callback always changes a variable and this variable is also listed in the dependency, then you are creating an infinite loop. Okay, if we have something like uh, uh, variable x as a dependency, and in the callback I have something like x equal to x plus 1, increase x, then I have an infinite loop because uh, let's assume that uh, um, x is a, is a state variable, for example, or also local variable. Because uh, where, uh, every time you are executing the callback, x will change. And since x uh, is in the uh, dependency array, 
the at change of x will schedule an ex another execution of the callback. Like we did here, we already saw here that uh, changing uh, open will trigger again the effect. This only will happen, in this case, it only happened once. Uh, for true to false, or for true to true, it only will trigger once. But if we, have, if we here, if we wrote uh, set open, not open, so we complement it, then it will never uh, stop. Because every time I see uh, a true, it becomes false. Every time I see it's false, it becomes true, and it will constantly re-trigger itself. Okay? So um, the idea is that inside uh, a callback, uh, we can modify, of course, the variables that are in the dependency list. Okay, we can do that. But let's ensure that we can do that. We will do that only on some, on some calls, on some invocations of the function. Not always. We need to ensure that after maybe one or two iterations, my callback reaches a set, uh, steady state and will not change the variables anymore. OK? Um, OK. And this was for normal effects, OK? Uh, effects, of course, uh, are useful when we, do, we need to do something outside the application, OK? Not, not something for synchronizing one part of the interface with the other. Um, and as we saw uh, last time inside the user factor, we, we do the um, uh, fetch to call an API, OK? This we already saw um, last time. And remember that uh, the, when we, for example, we read some information from the server, what we are actually doing is some asynchronous job that uh, ultima ultimately will set a state. Okay? We do some async job, and at the end, we set a state with the result of what we did, what we read from the server, and so on. A state is, uh, has already been initialized with some value. So remember that we are, uh, every time a component fetches something from an API server, it will render at least twice. The first time with the initial value of the state. And at least a second time after the effect has been executed, the fetch has been completed and the data has been analyzed, and finally the state has been changed. So with the new value of the state, uh, the component will render a, a second time. So it means that uh, we should imagine this component uh, to have at least uh, two internal states. One while the data is still loading, and the other one the day, once the data has already been loaded. So it tends to be normal for us uh, to have a, um, a render statement uh, where we check whether the state is still empty, we render something like you know, a loading message or a spinner icon, something like that, by saying, OK, I, I don't have anything to show you yet. And when the data is loaded, finally, we will switch to the real, we, are, we will actually render the, the data itself. OK, we already did that uh, last week, if you remember, in the client. Uh, uh, we had uh, some, I think, a question list. Yeah, remember that in the render phase, we decided whether to return as a, a loading page or the actual list of questions according to the state, uh, to the co actual content of a state variable. That in this case was. Uh, the list of questions, whether it was loaded or not. Okay? So it's quite normal uh, to imagine when the component uh, also depends. Of course, the component depends on its properties, depends on its state, but in this case, it also depends uh, on some external information. So if the component only depends on the property and the state, uh, it's quite easy, it's, very, it's a functional behavior. So just analyze those values and, uh, uh, and, and, and render 
when we have some external resources, uh, we should also think about the life cycle of this component. Okay. It starts empty. It cannot start with any prior information. It will start empty and uh, uh, then will be, become populated with some data. For this component and also for all the children of, the, of this component. Because if we are using this state question to pass some information down to some child component, uh, they will render the first time also with an empty list. Okay, so we need to ensure that either all the components are comfortable <laughs> with rendering an empty, lift, uh, an empty list, for example, or we avoid rendering that in this case by rendering some PS that doesn't depend on the list of questions. Okay, so we should also have in mind uh, the two states, before loading and after loading. And loading or reloading is the same. When we are modifying something, there will be some time in which the information is going sent to the API server and so on. So there will be some period of time in which the interface, and we'll see it today, uh, needs to be updated in some way. Okay, so there are some intermediate states to be rendered where maybe we want to avoid showing the user some stale information, or we want, we want to avoid the user to be able to interact with the interface when the data is still being processed and so on. So we should be careful with what we're doing uh, when we have uh, something um, in this case to load. Uh, in this case, this was a very simple component uh, where if the information was loaded or not, uh, was quite easy to know just by checking this state. Actually, it's not the real solution because imagine uh, an application where actually we don't have any questions. Okay? Maybe there are none. We just launched the website. Or more probably, w uh, when we analyze the list of answers to a question, as soon as the question is posted, there are no answers. So actually, if I just look at the state here, questions, I cannot tell apart whether the component is still loading or the component finished loading, but there's nothing inside. The empty array is actually the content that we loaded. Uh, this was a simple example, but there are more complex cases in, in which you really need to know whether the data you have is stable or we are still processing it in some, in some way asynchronously. Nothing of this is, is a problem if we are doing that synchronously inside the application with callback with states because everything is synchronized by React. But when we are synchronized with something external, the component React doesn't know, okay, what we are doing. So we need to keep track of that. So in more complex cases, we probably have some extra state to keep track of what we are doing. I don't know, like a state like a const loading, set loading. That initially is true. Okay, so the component starts in the loading state and becomes not loading after I have the set my question. So I would do some set loading of false here. And imagine you are reading different data from different API calls in a synchronous way, and you finish loading only when all of them are finished. So there's uh, an extra variable. So in this case, Again, we have something that starts uh, true and becomes false after I completed my callback and my API call. And in this case, uh, it will become easier in that in the body of the component, we have a, a, a special, say, state that will switch the render type. Okay? That's easier. In this case, it's not. Uh, in this case, we are, of course, if uh, we really have to render an empty list of questions, this is working. Because we have, we have 
basically three cases. Yeah? One, when we don't know yet how many questions there are, so we can only wait. And another, when we know how many questions we have, maybe they are zero, maybe they are more than zero. So if we need to do something, we could uh, also do it here. If uh, now questions dot uh, length equal to zero, we can re render no questions, something like that which is different, okay? A different condition. And imagine that uh, we are also adding some extra functionality, like adding a new question, something like that, or modifying a question. So when we add or modify something, we will have other you know, callbacks uh, that call uh, remote APIs and while these remote APIs are ongoing, uh, the component uh, will become loading again in some way, or updating some state in, we, in which we know uh, that we shouldn't show the table because it's being updated. So there is no way of, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say React doesn't know what the fetch is doing, what we are doing asynchronously. So we, if we need to, re, to reflect in the user interface that something is happening in the background, we should uh, plan on some kind of uh, local states here. Okay? There could be local states, there could be context variables, depending, of course, on, on the scope in which you are going to apply uh, this kind of uh, information. Okay, so again, in this case, we are no longer uh, thinking statically, like we did in React, where everything is functional. We need to, again, think sequentially uh, on what happens uh, uh, in different phases. Um, okay. Uh, this is an example of a state uh, which was all called waiting or loading or something like that, uh, that uh, whenever Look at this effect. Whenever something changes, this was a simple example where we type something in a box and then we show it uh, uh, you know, reversed, flip down in another part. And we imagine that we have an API server for doing that. Okay, so this flipping of the string is done on a, on a server. So whenever, what we are doing here, uh, we have uh, an input, a controlled input. Remember, a form, a well, controlled input which has a value and unchanged attributes applied. The value is linked to a state, text, and unchanged basically is uh, update, keeping that updated. Okay, so it is normal for a control component in a form. And then we have uh, a text flipped. Uh, that is printed in the, in, in the next row, okay? So whenever we type something, we change the text and say, okay, but whenever the text changes, we need to update also the reverse version of the text. So we can set an asynchronous effect triggered by changes of text. So what, the, what this effect is doing is to schedule a fetch so remember, that we are, again, we are inside an effect. If we need to do something asynchronous, we need to define an extra function and then call it synchronously, just because a sync cannot be used in an effect callback. So this is just an extra couple of rows that don't add anything. The, the real body of the effect is here. We schedule a fetch and we wait for the fetch to to complete, uh, and then we set the flip state, uh, and flip the uh, this string. Okay. So every time text is, is changed, uh, we, we call this API. And this logic here is independent from the logic of, of handing the form. So it's something that, let's say, checks the form, and whenever the form information changes, it will do something asynchronously to complete the content of the page. This is an, an, 
extreme example where we were trying to do some API call for some purpose because actually these three instructions could also be put here inside the event handler. Okay, we have one simple choice, like when the user types a letter, change the text, of course, update the form, and then call the API, fetch, and then set the state. Everything could be done here, inside this callback. There's no problem in calling fetch or asynchronous operation from a callback. The callbacker is executed in the commit phase, not in the render phase. So it can do asynchronous operations. Okay, asynchronous operation cannot be in the body of the function component because that will be the render phase. But they can be inside effects or inside callbacks. Callbacks linked to some user event because they will be executed in the commit phase where asynchronous operations are allowed. Okay? Uh, the problem is that in this case, uh, uh, the, so we could, we could, this effect would not be really needed. Actually, it's better to define it because uh, if the user types very quickly, okay, at every key press, the callback is called. And we need to do an extra API call every, at every quick keystroke, it will slow down actually the website. While here, if the user types quickly, the text will change maybe many times in between, but the effect maybe it will only run once. Okay? So in this case, we can decouple the asynchronous updating from the you know, uh, user actions. But <coughs> let's just keep this as an example. Um, we know that the, this text here will update uh, some milliseconds after we type. Because we, we first type, then we do the fetch, and after some milliseconds, uh, we can set the, 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 the new text and re-render the component. If we want to keep track of the fact that the text is being updated, uh, we could add uh, some waiting state like we did before. So what we see is that the uh, waiting state becomes true, waiting or loading, becomes true when we run the fetch, when we launch the fetch. Remember that the fetch flipped here is calling this function, fetch, and then goes to sleep, waiting for, uh, on this await statement. So we are setting the state to true, schedule the fetch, and go to sleep. And when we go to sleep, the waiting state will become true. And so in the rendering phase, if waiting is true, we can show a hourglass or something like that. Then as soon as the fetch returns, assuming there are no errors, then we can set the update the flipped uh, text and set the waiting phase to uh, state to false again. So actually the waiting state will uh, always be false except in the time interval between the start of the fetch and the return of the fetch. So when actually there is a, knife in a, in a remote call in progress. Okay, so that's Unfortunately, it's our responsibility to be able to manage that. Initially, the waiting state has been set to true. It could also be set to false. Uh, um, having it true means that initially we are showing the hourglass uh, until, remember, the effect always ran at the beginning. At the mount of the component, the effect, all the effects will run. Okay, so even the first time, or even before the user types anything, we are calling this API once. Right? 
And so by calling it to answer, we are, of course, we are flipping an empty text because the text is also empty. We, we could avoid calling fetch, maybe we can do that. And if, uh, if the text is empty, then return empty. No, there would be also a possibility. But in any case, we are setting uh, the weighting to false after that. So when we initially load the component, we will see the hard glass for an instant of time, and then it will disappear after this effect has been run for the first time before the user could interact with the component. Then the user starts typing, and the effect will run every time the text is being uh, changed. OK, so every time we need to provide some feedback to the user that something is going on, we need to do some, some trick like this. Um, we mentioned the cleanup function. Uh, something that we, we won't need very often. Um, if a user effect is uh, allocating some resources, maybe opening some uh, longer, uh, long connection or um, opening some files or doing something or storing something in the browser memory, um, in these cases, but are quite you know, rare cases, when the component unmounts, uh, we need to clean up or to free the resources, okay? And for doing that, uh, we mentioned that uh, uh, we can provide a cleanup function and to, uh, to the effect. And the way we provide the cleanup function is that we return it uh, from the callback body. So it's quite strange because we have uh, a user factor with a callback, and inside the callback, we are running the code whenever the dependencies change. So we are running this code here, the side effect, when the component mounts and when the dependencies change. Plus, we are returning a function whose code we will only be executed once just before the component unmounts, if we need it. Okay? So it's very strange because this actually function is returned every time. Every time we run the effect, uh, the, the, that return statement will be executed. But its content will only be used once at the, at the end. It's very strange. The, the designer of the effect could have just uh, uh, thought of, having, of providing two different callbacks, one to be run and one to, for the cleanup. And instead of providing two arguments to use effect, they invented a very strange mechanism, okay? Which is the reason why we cannot use an async here. Because the effect callback must return a function, and an async would return a promise, which is incompatible. Okay, but as I mentioned, probably we never use that in our, uh, in our uh, exercises. Uh, don't get too enthusiastic about effects, okay? Um, these are good for accessing external resources, but they may not be needed if, you, if what you are doing is just to synchronize in different parts of your application. Um, there's no need of using a user effect for reading some state variable and updating another state variable. Don't use effect to track changes in states. So imagine we have a state with a number, and you need another state with the square of this number, for example. Okay, so you could imagine setting up an effect that whenever the number changes, it will recompute the square and set a different state. Of course, it can be done. It will work. But it's an extra and say overload on the system and also extra cognitive overload because you have something that is happening asynchronously. Why the best way would just be to say, okay, whenever I need the square of this value, I just recompute the square. Let's not store in states. Let's try to be really um, lean on the use of states and effects. 
where they are really needed. We don't store in states, in a state of a component, something that can be computed from other states or properties. If it can be computed, let's compute it at every render. Because it's more you know, heavy to keep track of its changes and recompute only when it's needed than just to recompute itself. Okay, don't use um, to transform data needed for rendering. Uh, like uh, you had in, uh, you know, in, the, in the filter list, remember, in your exercise, where several people were trying to have a state with the list of, uh, the full list of movies and another state with a filtered list. And you found that it was a nightmare because uh, it's easy when you change filter to update the, the filtered state. But when you start changing the, the full list, so you are keep adding or removing, then you need to reconcile the two and then to recompute the second, the filtered one from the first one and something like that. Also, every one of you did some different, uh, uh, chose different solution, but you all felt that it was complex. Why? Because you have a state which is derived from another state, the full list of movies, and a property, the current filter. And if it can be derived, let's just recompute it. It will save a lot of problems, okay? And also don't use effects for doing that. So always ask yourself when you are planning to do some computation inside an effect or define a state variable, can it be recomputed from the states and the property that we have? In this case, never create an extra state and never create an extra effect. You may wonder, yes, but recomputing the filter every time is slow, slow the application. Yes. But for that reason, for that purpose, there are other hooks, like, for example, use memo that memorizes a value and recomputes it only when needed. So instead of just, uh, I was, my suggestion is the when you first develop the application, just recompute everything at every render. Then if you have some performance problem, try to memorize some computation. So have a look at the use memo hook. It's very easy. Say, okay, a callback. It's very similar to use effect, but it's thought for non-asynchronous effects for local uh, computation. I will store the partial result of a computation and recompute it when the arguments will change. So in that case, you will we will be saving extra computations without introducing extra states. So it will not be your responsibility anymore to, to remember to update the state, okay? Um, and uh, second point, uh, whenever you can do something inside the uh, callback, a non-click callback, for example, do it there. Don't delay it. Uh, like we did be in this example that was called. We are changing a value, a text, and then we are reacting on the text change for doing something more. Well, we could just simply run the fetch here. Okay, instead of scheduling it in effect. So when you think, uh, when you see that you, are, you have some uh, external action, like a post or a get, an, no, an API call, that is uh, linked, synchronized with some user actions, so with some event call, uh, user callback, think of uh, calling the API directly from, uh, from the callback without introducing an effect. So actually the effect will be useful mainly in two, in two cases. When we need to do something at mount time, when the component runs the first time. We need data to show, we need to load it, even before any user action. It can be synchronous, it cannot be in the render phase, it must be in an effect that we run at the beginning, so the call once an effect to be called once at the beginning. That cannot be obtained in any other way. Loading data at the beginning of the component. Uh, 
it's very rare that we need to set an effect that will call at every render. What we need to do asynchronously every time the component renders. Uh, it may probably be that we forgot the second argument. And then, of course, there's a general case of providing a dependency array when we need uh, um, some component to react uh, on another one. Let's imagine, for example, a list uh, of items, you know, the classical interface with two panels. In the left panel, we have a list of items, like an email application, a list of mails, and in the right panel, you have the content of the, of the current mail. Okay? But the current, the current mail is not, uh, um, not loaded. Not all the mails are preloaded. They are not in the state. So whenever the user changes or selects a different message on the left pane, you must, uh, what does it do? It will change a state in the component. And this state will go as a property to the right pane component. The right pane component is still there. We are not rebuilding the component, destroying or rebuilding the component. We are just changing a property. But the change of this property will force the right pane component to reload, to load a new message to be displayed. So in this case, we have a left pane that just handles its own state. Message one, message two, message three, according to where the user clicks. And the right pane that receives in the property the idea of the mail, and if it changes, it needs to reload it. So that's the case where, in the dependency, we would have props.messageID. So we will load the message the first time the right pane is rendered, but every time some extra variable, some say, side context changes, then the component will need to reload its data, for example. Okay, this is uh, uh, something that we do when we don't have the data ready, okay, on the, in the right-hand side. It needs to load something from outside, and so we need an effect to load it. If the right-hand uh, side, like we did in, the, in, the, in our exercises here in the labs, uh, is already loaded, then you don't need to call an API, as uh, you just need to filter or select uh, the element that you want to display from your state that you already have. And so in that case, uh, there's no need to, to schedule data synchronously. Just the component will take a property saying display question number three, and the question is already there. So I will just uh, display question on number three from the state with all that contains all the questions. Okay, so the effects are very uh, powerful, but let's try to use that power only when it's really needed, okay? To simplify our application. Avoid an effect that changes a state, that triggers another effect, that changes some other state, and so on, and you lose track of what the application is doing very easily, okay? Also because, uh, remember, that an effect uh, will run when the data changes. And so maybe you are doing a set state of something, and the new state will be identical to the old one, and so the next effect will not render. So don't use a state change to trigger an action. If you need to do, is do something, let's do it. Let's not write a change a variable, a state variable, and expect something else to run. More functions to be called and less effects to be synchronized, okay? As a, as a warning, okay, let's try to really, um, and it's also, I, I'm doing this uh, and uh, I point, I'm pointing you also to some uh, this article that tells you some examples where you should not need an effect uh, because there are a lot of uh, exam examples out there uh, where people are really using effects where, where they are not needed because they just learn the mechanism and say, okay, I need to update this. And so I need a, an effect to update. No, maybe I just need to recompute. Okay, let's not be afraid of recomputing. 
Uh, okay, as I said, uh, you, in the case we need, we have uh, performance problems uh, in recomputing something, just have a look uh, at the use memo that memorizes a computation, the result of a computation, and recomputes it every, every time the parameters change. So we put in a function the computation and use this use memo that does the computation only when the arguments change. And uh, uh, it's a hook. Or if, if it's, a, it's a function that needs to be memorized, it's use callback. But it's, uh, use memo can be more useful. But in general, let's introduce those as optimizations. And remember, optimization should only be inserted after everything else is done. Okay? After everything is, is, is implemented. Okay. So that was the, some, say, extra information or some warning about uh, uh, its effects. And uh, uh, we saw that basically uh, effects uh, are for managing API calls. And uh, in general, if we are thinking uh, as, uh, to an application as a whole, uh, we, uh, it can be useful not to separate uh, different types of states in the application. So let's imagine all the use state hooks that you are using, many of them will be states for presentation purposes. So what the user is currently displaying. What is the current router in the client? What is the selected language? No. What is the content of the form that the user is typing? There's a, there's a lot of state that is only uh, used uh, um, currently in the browser, with the current state of the browser. It doesn't need to be stored anywhere. It's not in the database. No, we can call it local state or presentation state or view state. It's something that doesn't involve any API interaction. And this is probably most of it. And it's probably distributed in different components or different parts of the components because every part of the application of this screen needs to manage its own interaction with the user. Thanks. Once in a while, of course, uh, this state needs to be maybe saved or persisted on the server. Okay, I have a, a very complex form. I need to fill it, validate it and, it, and check it. It's all on the client. And then at the end, when I click on submit, uh, this data must be packed and transferred to the server. Or when you are getting from the server a list of questions, whatever. We are reading from the, some information which is in the back end. So in this case, uh, in this uh, application state, uh, in the state which is used for displaying something in the application, but is also stored in the server. It's also persisted in the server. And this is, uh, is where we have problems. Because now we have two copies of the same information. One in the server and one in the browser. When we open the browser, the component will mount and an effect will, will run. And the effect will uh, do a fetch to get the information. So right after the fetch, we have two copies of the same information. One in the, data, in the database, in the SQL form, and the other in the React application in, in JSON form in JavaScript objects. OK? That's for the moment. And then what happens is if one of the two copies changes for some reason? What happens, what happens is the values on the server changes. Why? Because other users are, are using the same application. So other users are adding data voting up or down, or changing something in the server. And my copy on the client doesn't know that. On the other hand, if we are doing something on the client, maybe we are voting or deleting something, we know, we already did it, we modify the local state, the application state. But that state 
becomes um, disaligned, not, not, not aligned anymore with the, with the server state. So when we delete something locally, we should also delete it on the server to keep them aligned. So, and this is a fact of life, whenever we have two copies or something, we need to do some extra effort to keep them in sync. And sync is two-way. When something changes on the server, how, uh, how often should I update it on the client? And the other way, when something is updated on the client, uh, I should immediately uh, inform the server. Hmm? Um, especially, we should uh, Update the backend whenever we do some create and update or delete uh, actions uh, on our client. The real truth is always the server. Okay? The client only gets a fresh copy of the data, but the real truth is always the server. So when the user is doing some action, let's inform the server as soon as possible. And uh, Maybe we should be aware that we are not the only person in the world that is using the, the application. And so the data that we loaded from the server may change due to some other users. And so in some way, we cannot assume that the, the, data, the data that we fetched 30 seconds ago is still valid. Now imagine we have an answer with a score of five. I click on up, and so I will be setting the score to six. But in the meantime, some other user already voted up the same, the same answer, and so the final result should be seven. But locally, both users loaded the five, and they thought the increase would go to six. Only the server knows, or will know, or we should make sure that the server knows that there they were two separate increments. And so we'll count them both. That is why in the API implementation, we didn't have a set score API, but a vote up API. Because the server can increase it. If the server cannot trust a client and say, OK, now the vote is six. Wait, wait. It may be six because you saw a five and you incremented it. But some other people in the meantime already incremented that. Maybe two or three times. This score is already nine. I cannot trust you to tell me, okay, you voted up, so the new score is six. Okay, so every operation that mm, modifies the data should always rely on the real knowledge of the server. Don't trust a client giving you data that may be out of date. And it's a problem because you cannot trust yourself. You maybe are trying to vote something that has already been deleted from another user, by another user. So what are we voting for? So the server should also Never trust a client with some operation because this client could have sent this operation with a knowledge of the state which is no longer valid. And also on the client side, let's, let's speak of the, the vote up operation. I have a five, I click on it, I will see a six. But the database already has a nine or a ten. But I'm still showing a six because I locally incremented what I read some time ago and I thought it was right. Unless I have some extra mechanism for saying, okay, now some time has passed, so maybe it's better to reload it or to refresh this information. Or when I modify something, oh, okay, I, I need to, in some way, update my data every second, every hour. It depends, okay, but I, I, I shouldn't really uh, trust it, okay? And we see, we, today we'll try to see some examples how to do that, okay? 
these are the problems, not just uh, calling API, but keeping sync the data when we are starting to modify something. Hmm? Um, from the organization of the code, we'll try to uh, locate all the APIs in a, an, ex an, extra, an external file, okay, so that we can modify them, also we can develop them, as we saw uh, last time, one by one. Maybe we have a version with fake data and we have a fair, uh, or fake interaction and another version with the real client server interaction. So <clears throat> it's easy to, to evolve the API calls uh, and swapping them with stub functions uh, uh, while we are developing the application. The, the rule that we try, the pattern that we try to follow is that the API classes or files or classes, maybe we have one, we have more, it depends on you, of course, but we have some files that contains API operations. They should not depend on any states or properties. They should be self-contained functions. We give them the information they need to do the fetch or to do the get or the post or the put and nothing more. They shouldn't know, okay, where the, uh, the state is coming from or which components are being affected. Actually, what we are doing here in the API.js, we are building the client from the API that we implemented in the server. It's just a mirror. If you have a get API in the server, we implement in the API.js the call to that get. When is it needed? What is needed for? We don't care. We just provide the interface for calling the remote APIs. All the intelligence will be in the components, okay? And on the other hand, we should refrain from calling fetch or have any other low-level information in the components. Okay, the components should call a function that will return a value or throw an exception if something went wrong with the API call. Remember always that asynchronous operations can be unreliable, okay, can, can, we can have some errors. So let's try to keep those separated with, uh, uh, with a bit more organized, uh, say, code. So in our, in our architecture, we have all the components, uh, they have the states, uh, if, uh, effects, uh, even tenders, uh, everything that we already know, and API.js that calls fetch on the client side. On the server side, nothing changed. We already have it uh, that gets uh, the information from the fetch and uh, filters with the routes uh, and calls the database operations. Okay, we didn't touch the server. Okay, remember last time we only touched it for course, for the course, uh, um, let's say, authorization, but for the rest, it was already built. We are just organizing this layer here right now. And in um, React uh, jargon, we, uh, the, oh, some authors are talking, are using these strange words like uh, rehydrating or dehydrating a component. Okay? Like uh, uh, rehydrating uh, a component or rehydrating a component a second time means uh, putting data inside the component itself. So uh, a component is there, it needs to be hydrated the first time, so the component is like an empty uh, okay, container and we put some information in it, uh, some liquid, some water, no, it's, it's data, it's not information. And when we do it the first time, usually it's in a effect to be run a lot a lot of time. And maybe it needs to be rehydrated for some reason. Because uh, maybe we can have a a timeout that is running and will refresh the data every now and then. Uh, and so we are rehydrating the same component over and over again. Or um, the, uh, the opposite operation sometimes is called dehydrating, so like dumping the state information to the server. So the components know something that should be pushed to the server. So that the same component, if the same component dies in immediately after, it can also rehydrate itself from the server. 
it's a French terminology. It's just loading and saving, okay? But if, if you find some, in some articles, these strange uh, terms uh, that are ma basically managed by uh, libraries that then try to automate this stuff for you. We are doing that by hand, okay? But there are uh, libraries out there, like Tankstack Query, for example, that try to automate all the stuff for you. You just declare which are the API to call and which are the data that you want to map, and they will try to keep that in sync for you, okay? Automatically. But uh, in this course, we are trying to at least uh, no, do that uh, at, the, at the low level. Okay, Hy hydrating amount of time is very, it's what we already did. We have an, an effect uh, that runs a, fat, an, a get. I put the code here, but it should really into an API.js file. And, uh, and then uh, we call it and use it for set list with the management probably of a loading state. It's identical to what we did before. And we render according to whether the component is loading or not. Um, the refreshing the state is most difficult because it means that we should know that some state in the server has changed. And so we need to refresh our client. How can we know that? We can't. In a client server, in a client server protocol like HTTP, you can never know what happens in the server until you ask it. So there are some moments in which we are sure that something changes, is when we change it. So if we are changing something, we tell the server that we change it, and that's a good point to refresh our data because for sure, at least our changes are being applied. Maybe our changes are being applied on top of other changes that, okay, it's good to refresh. So if some data changes locally, we could uh, set an effect or inside an event handler to just uh, post the data or make a put uh, to update the, the, the information on the server. On the other hand, if some data change on the server due to some other user, which are not ourselves, we cannot know when this happens. We can don't care. Okay, maybe what I'm seeing is uh, uh, not updated. Or we could set some interval timer that periodically will refresh the data. So a component with the state that is being loaded from the server, where we have an effect that set an interval timer that every, you know, five seconds or whatever, does a fetch to get the, the data. And if the data changes, then it will do a set state to update the state, and then everything will be updated, because in React, when, we, when you change the state, everything is automatically propagated. So we will have a sort of a, of a polling operation that periodically will check the information. If you are setting an interval, in an interval, remember to um, delete this interval timer. Because a set timeout only fires one. But a set interval fires forever. And if, if you put a set interval instead, instead inside an effect, um, then the interval is set when you render the component. If you then switch out the component and re-render it again a second time from scratch, it will set a second interval, but the first one will still be running. So always rem remember, if in certain effect you need to set an interval timer, remember in the cleanup function to delete that interval timer when the component goes out of scope. Well, if you are doing that in app, in the app component, there's no problem because the app is always rendered. But in any other component, uh, be careful if you want to set an interval timer to remember to destroy it uh, when the component goes out of scope with an effect cleanup function. If we can avoid that, it's better, okay? So um, 
In the, uh, in the exam, we will uh, mostly try to ignore this problem because to be solved really, it requires a lot of uh, effort, a lot of extra checks and so on. Okay, this is what we call the end clients problem that we have one server that is being accessed by many client, clients and many users that are doing their own stuff. And sometimes the data I'm modifying here is not shown by this other user because it's doing something else. And so they can live together happily. But sometimes different clients will be seeing or were modifying the same data. And that's the problem of the server to be able to do the right thing. Maybe to accept the first modification or the second or throw an error. There's some policy to be defined here. So there are policies on the server. What happens if multiple clients are trying to manipulate the same data? And the policy on the clients uh, how, that will basically ask themselves, uh, themselves uh, how can I be sure that the data my user is operating on is still valid? OK. Uh, this is a, is, a, is a complex problem that cannot be totally solved in a client-server fashion, like only with HTTP. OK, there's no solution, real solution. We can only try to mitigate that by refreshing often or doing some extra checks and so on. If you really need to have something that keeps in sync multiple clients at the same time, you know, Google Documents, where people are typing and they see immediately what the other is typing, uh, we, you cannot just rely on HTTP. No, you can use something like WebSockets or other protocols where the server could push information to the client as soon as it's updated. <clears throat> it's no longer the client that asks for, makes a request and waits for the response but the client will keep a channel open and the server can push information to that. It also means that the server should be more complex because the server should have the notion of the application state also. So that's a whole new level of complexity that we are not, uh, we don't have the time you know, to, to go into that will make you know, real, real time applications, let's say, feasible. We are trying to, we are not going to deal with this problem it requires other protocols and other frameworks. Uh, something you will see in the web application too on the server side. Uh, something about web sockets uh, you will see in the other um, distributed system, um, distributed yeah, protocol. I don't remember the name of the course. Uh, Professor Sisto later that will also show uh, you something about web sockets and other type of protocol for distributed computing. So just know that there are solutions, uh, but uh, in the six credits here, we are not able to, to go there. We'll just try to avoid dangerous situations, okay? And basically what we are trying to do is to refresh the browser when we need, when we change something, let's do it for refreshing, and uh, uh, doing some extra check on the server. Always uh, distrust the data coming from the client. Always check whether the data is still relevant when you come from a client. Hmm? Uh, so uh, the, we will uh, adopt uh, what we call the better than nothing solution. Okay, try to refresh. When you're doing some, any modification, refresh it. We are doing some extra gets, some extra loss. Maybe we are risking of uh, doing extra API calls to get the same data over and over again. Okay, we can live with that, okay? Just for having something uh, that is not really a solution, but uh, at least it mitigates the problem. Um, the final point is uh, um, there are some, we already mentioned about infinite loops with these effects. In those cases, there were stupid loops where I'm updating the same variable on which I'm depending. Okay. But there are some tricks, especially when uh, um, the dependency array. So the variables that are using dependencies are objects or arrays themselves. 
Okay, this is a stupid uh, case in which I'm creating, let's say, uh, an infinite loop here. If you see here, what, do, what I'm doing wrong, I forgot the dependency array. So this is actually running at every render. And uh, wh when it's run, it changes the state, and so it causes another render. And so the application will be stuck here forever. Okay? I render the first time, I increase, I schedule an increment of C. When C is incremented, the component is rendered again. And since I don't have an argument, uh, uh, dependency array in the effect, uh, the second render will run the effect again that will schedule a, a, a state change again and so on. So always remember your dependency array, even if it's empty, especially if it's empty, don't forget it, okay? Um, okay. This value has nothing to do here. Uh, actually, the idea for this component uh, was to keep track uh, of how many times this value was changed by the user. Now, the idea of this implementation was, okay, let's have a value and we count how many times the user changed the value while completing the form. Uh, the real solution is that, okay, if we need to keep into account how many times the value changed, uh, we should, of course, uh, uh, increase the counter only when value changes. So in this case, it was a perfectly normal effect to increase some state, but uh, we should always remember when we should do that, okay? In this case, the value. Um, by the way, just a minor point, uh, we are initializing the state to the counter to minus one. Why? Because the effect is always run at least once at mount time. Okay, so if we, if we initialize the counter to zero, then at the amount of time of the component, before the user could type anything, I would uh, already have increased it to one for the initial effect run. So to counter that, I'm starting from minus one. So always remember, we tend to think of effects to run at the beginning, and there's one category, or to run whenever something changes, and that's another category. The problem is that also effects that we think in our mind that depends on a value, they do, but they also run at the beginning. So let's not forget the first time, the bound time. Okay, the second problem is uh, when we have uh, an object as a dependency. So secret is an object that contains a value and a counter, maybe, okay? And the effect wants to increase the counter. Yes, increasing a counter means increasing a property of a state variable. But we know that state variable should be mutable. I cannot modify secret dot count plus plus. We already learned that we, when we need to modify a state, we should rebuild a new variable with all the fields identical except the one that we want to modify. And this is what I'm doing here. Uh, to increase a value, uh, then I recreate an object where I change the count to a new value. But this will recreate a new object and the, uh, the dependency array will see a new object that may change. So I only maybe wanted to depend on value or one property of the object, but I actually am depending on the whole object. So if any of the property will change, the object will change. And if I'm changing even one project, one property, I'm rebuilding the object, and so I will re-trigger it. So this uh, 
effect will uh, run forever again. If the value is secret, then I create an increase in the count, but I'm changing the secret object, uh, the, the state variable itself. And so I will run it again. The value will again be secret because it didn't change in the, mid, in the meantime. I just copy it like it was. And I will increase it again and so on. And so this is the same if we are depending on an object or depending on an array. Because every time in our mind we are thinking of ch changing a property or adding an element to an array or changing an element to an array, we should remember that in states uh, we must rebuild the object or rebuild the array. And so that will re-trigger the, the, the effect. So uh, try always to depend on atomic values. So this should have a dependency not on secret, but on secret.value. The value is not being rebuilt. We are just copying it over. OK, we, are, we have a new object that reuses the same properties and redefines one of them. But the other properties are just being copied. Imagine the reference, OK, to an object. I'm copying the reference. So this reference, secret.value, didn't change. And in this case, only when value changes, I run the effect. I change value. The value becomes secret. I increase the count and then stop because the secret object has changed, but it's not in dependency. Secret.value didn't change. And so uh, I, I stop the, the triggering. I, I don't have extra triggers. So as soon as possible, do not use objects or dependencies, but use single properties of the object. Just be surgical. What are the variables that they want to observe? And let's try not to modify the variables that we are observing. And the same for arrays. Um, the same issue may happen with arrays, that we are rebuilding them every time and so on. Uh, in the dependency, if we put uh, the name of an array, this was a state called list in this case. Uh, um, you see that we are, OK, in this case, we are loading that at the beginning, OK? So I have a get items, so I will fetch and set list items. We should remember the lesson that told us, okay, but since in the, call, in the effect callback you are using items, we are using a variable items, you should put it in the dependencies. This was one rule, remember. Every variable inside an effect should be in the dependency array to avoid having stale data. But if I really put a list here, okay, the f at the first render, I'm running the effect, I'm fetching it, I'm setting the list. Set list will, for the first time, create a new object coming from the JSON call. So it will change the dependency array. So the value list would have changed, and so it would re-trigger it again. When I re-trigger this again, I will set list with the same values, probably, but another object, another array object. And again, again, I'm still doing it over and over again. OK. So um, use a, I, if you need to do something like that, use some extra state that will tell you whether it's the first time or not, for example, or use some property of the array. Maybe one dependency that I see often Used is the length attribute. So instead of depending by on list, you depend on list dot length. 
So it will run when the length increases from zero to the actual length, but then we stop because if you reload it again the second time, the length doesn't change. It's not foolproof because if you change some value inside, the length doesn't change and the effect should probably run. So it's not really a solution using the length, only in some cases, only when the array could only increase, not when it could change inside. Okay? Or use extra states to keep track of that. So the rule is uh, try to use a single variable, single values, single properties, number strings uh, in the dependency array. All of them, all, the, all that are needed, but only simple values. Because complex values will, uh, in the, due to, to the functional nature of React, uh, the complex values will be recomputed every time. And so we re trigger the effect uh, every time. That's why. We, um, again, we appreciate the suggestion of before of don't create many effects because they, co they may cause trouble. <laughs> okay, so only use them when you need it. Um, okay, this is uh, an example of D8 rating, but we'll see that in the, in the exercise of, uh, um, this is an example of an add operation. Adding something, we have an add button. And what do we do on, a, on, on an add button? We update the list of elements by adding a new one. This operation updates the local application state, the local state in the browser. But also, we must update the server because we changed something. And so at the same time we are updating the current state, the local state, we should also update the remote state. And these two, if everything goes right, they will be synchronized. So I'm adding an element here and I'm adding the same element on the server. The problem is uh, if other clients are modifying it, or if uh, uh, there are some errors. Maybe this post doesn't go through for some reason. The connection for the moment is wrong. But the user interface will show the element in the interface because I added to the local state. But the operation for updating the remote state failed for some reason. So the user is convinced that they added that. But the server never gets this information. This is a sort of an optimistic update, I hope. I update something, I inform the server, and they hope, it, hope everything goes right. Uh, we have uh, actually, this is the fastest solution. We immediately update the user interface and start in parallel, in background, uh, an update of the server. The user doesn't see any lag, any delay. It will immediately see the new data that we added. We are really hoping that this fetch doesn't fail or doesn't create any error. Do we have any alternative to this, to this hope? Well, it could be the other way around. First, we update the server. Then, if, every, if everything is okay with the server, we update the local state. That's robust. I'm sure that I'm updating the local state only when I'm sure that uh, this, the remote state has been correctly updated. The drawback is slower. Not slower in general, but slower from the user point of view. Because the user clicks on add, and the item doesn't appear immediately. It will appear only maybe 200 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, after it went through to the server. And then it will appear. So your interface will stutter, OK? You push a button, nothing happens, and then it will happen. It's not comfortable, OK? 
it's not very nice to the user. But when it appears, you are sure that it's valid data. The problem is that there's a mean time in which the user is wondering, did I click on the button? Because I click and nothing happened. And so the user clicks twice. <laughs> and then it gets an error because he's trying to add the same data a uh, second time or whatever. So this uh, is the robust solution for the data integrity point of view. It's not very nice for the user interface point of view. Are there better solutions? Yeah, you can get as, as complex as you want. One solution could be this one, or updating the state in parallel. So doing the first one, parallel updates, fast and risky, but at the same time, wait for the response from the server. And possibly, if the response is wrong, invalidate, or refresh, or reload everything. For example, I have a get items here, which is just a function that reloads all the list of items. Okay? So what I'm doing here on an add is uh, add sets uh, the set element, uh, no, sorry, on click, add item. Add item is here that immediately adds the item to the user interface. Maybe we are marking it in some way. I wrote here temp or with some icon or in gray to show, okay, this item that you just added is still in transit, it's still temporary. But we immediately show the feedback of my action with some note that is temporary. In parallel, we are running the API call to save the server, and when the server responds in a positive way, get items, reload everything. It's not a big issue. So actually we are doing, we are calling two APIs in sequence, a post for sending the data and a get for reloading the same data. And reloading the same data, of course, will refresh my whole page and we'll regenerate this new item also, with new element, without a temporary icon or whatever. That's one possibility. The other possibility is more surgical. Instead of get item reloading everything, I will just remove the temporary indicator for that. But uh, it's more difficult in this case uh, because if I have many modifications running on at the same time, you should remember which one went through and so imagine you are adding two, two items at the same time, clicking two on two lines at the same time, uh, when the, you, must, you must have extra work to remember which one is which, which one completed correctly and which one is still pending. Reloading everything that also has the extra benefit of bringing any other modifications that could have been made by the other users. So that's a sensible trade-off. We are showing something immediately. We are uh, checking whether the API goes through, and in any case, we are refreshing the data with our own modifications, plus maybe other modifications that came from the server. Hmm? Uh, if we really want, uh, in this, uh, we could have an extra state uh, like loading or updating, that would maybe prevent other user actions at the same time. So we don't want the user to do anything else while we are still processing a previous change. So we have an a low, a updating state that will disable the buttons, for example, until the data is solid. Disable all the buttons, or only those on the current modif currently modified rows, that's a whole world of choices here. Just be aware that we are trying to keep in sync local application state and remote state, and they should be done synchronously, 
and something should always go wrong, could also go, always go wrong with my uh, post or my data updates. Okay, so that's the, the game. Uh, we can try uh, to apply these rules uh, in, uh, in our application. And uh, uh, try to integrate the remaining functionalities in our application. Okay, now we have the front end that are being developed with the, with the routes for different screens. What we have to do is to add some uh, server actions uh, for loading and modifying data. So all the operations like uh, add, uh, modify, and so on, and delete uh, that we had on the answers should be in a way re-implemented again, not, no longer on the, on the local state, but on the remote state using these patterns, okay? So that's where, what we are trying to do in the next hour after the break. Uh, I will also want to spend uh, at the beginning, right after the, the, the break, some words about uh, um, the procedure for the exam. Okay, so what are the steps, what are the times, and so on. So uh, when we go back at uh, 11.55, we start by discussing the exam and then try to work on the exercise. Okay, thank you.